Hello and welcome to this SimLogic webinar. My name is Emma Simpson and I'm your facilitator for today's webinar. This webinar will be recorded and we will ensure the recording is sent out to you all in the following days. So just a brief note on housekeeping. We want to make the webinar as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions during the webinar that you'd like to ask, please use the questions panel on the right hand side of your screen and we will address them via email after the webinar is finished. So a little bit about your presenter today. Um, Chris Borodale is our IT manager and he's had many years of experience not only installing and configuring solutions but also building them and integrating them with other applications. Chris has been working within the IT industry since 1998 and has worked with more small startups as well as large big blue chip companies across many different sectors working with shop floor operators through to senior executives. Chris has built systems that world-class manufacturers now depend on for the profitability. A little bit about SimLogic. For 20 years, we've specialised in industrial, in industrial operational technology, operational support, operational excellence, and manufacturing operations management. SimLogic have a proven track record of improving efficiencies in small and multinational companies. Manufacturing is our passion and we strive to ensure UK manufacturers are operating as effectively as possible through the adoption of the latest technology and world-class solutions. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to today's host, Chris Borodale, IT Manager at SimLogic. Hello, and welcome again to uh, the webinar, as Emma said, addressing cybersecurity. Um, my name is Chris Brodel, as Emma said, the IT manager here at SimLogic, and until we hire our own CISO, I'm specifically tasked with addressing all of the issues we will discuss today, chief person in charge of information security here. I wonder how many of your companies already employ CISO. This is rapidly becoming the fastest growing C-level employee ta type across all sectors. According to Robert Grimsey, a director at Harvey Nash, the average salary of 130,000 back in 20, 2015. If you haven't got a CISO yet, expect to have one soon. One of the hot topics of this year, and no doubt the next few to come, is cybersecurity. The growing interconnected nature of electronic devices of all types is one reason for this. Combined with the unfortunately all too human predilection to try and subvert good intentions in order mainly to extort money from individuals or enterprises. Today, we'll be looking at the following topics. Securing remote access comprises such areas as VPNs, passcodes and passwords, two-form factor authentication, and of course, firewall technologies. The edge of your network is where security starts, but it is by no means the end of the story. Network security, the fabric of the enterprise, the web that can link all your devices together, can be a force for good, but in the hands of those who wish to do harm unless well designed, documented and above all monitored, it can be used against you. We will look at micro segmentation, one way traffic filters, least privilege access and known source destination routes amongst other things. All of which can be helpful approaches to ensure that in the event of intrusion through remote access or intentional internal misuse, the damage can be contained and limited. Network monitoring is of course crucial here because however well designed your network, the sooner you know of a possible incident, the sooner you can put into place response measures to mitigate harm and begin the process of further hardening your security against the weaknesses that was exploited. The race between those who wish to do good and those who wish to do ill is constant. And as such, you need to approach security from a continuous improvement standpoint. If we imagine that both the edge and internals of your network have been penetrated and you find yourself in the unfortunate position that ill-meaning agents have gained access to your equipment on your production line, what can you do to ensure both digital and physical safety is maximized at this level? How can you provide security on your production lines? SCADA and PLC systems have traditionally run on an air-gapped network, often referred to as the OT network as opposed to the IT network. However, this air gap is now being removed with a view to getting direct data from the factory floor into ERP systems and in front of end users who wish to use this data to drive efficiencies and productivity by using big data analysis tools to trend and inform decision making. 
A paradigm shift is required, therefore, in our approach to these systems and softwares. And increasingly, with the advent of the propensity and widespread distribution of Internet of Things devices and, in an industrial environment, their counterparts, IIoT devices, all potentially networked devices and configurations must assume that no protection exists around them. They need to be designed and set up to protect themselves as best as is possible. Topics here include such things as default usernames and passwords, minimizing surface areas, privilege escalation prevention, patching and updates. Antivirus protection, including malware, ransomware and DDoS, distributed denial of service, is another piece in this puzzle in which all of our topics come together to complete the overall security picture which we must all try to ensure is clear and strong enough to protect our enterprises. Security is no longer optional for anyone at any level in an organization and much as the bad guys learn and develop their ways and means by sharing, so must we all. So let's start with securing remote access. It, as I've mentioned, this comprises such areas as VPNs, passcodes and passwords, two-form factor authentication and firewall technologies. As previously mentioned, the edge of your network is where security starts. And a common metaphor to use is the home. In our homes, we ought to feel safe and secure, to know who is in, usually, and, when appropriate, who we have invited in. We need all of these things because in our homes are things of value, of course. Things that people may wish to steal or do harm to. Our front door we can think of as being that used by staff when on site and using enterprise provided computers to access our network. These are our family, identifiable and least likely to attempt to hurt us or take things because, as our staff, they would be hurting themselves indirectly if they were to hurt the enterprise. They have keys to get in through the front door. The physical site locations often have RFID tabs, photo ID badges, or simple good old-fashioned keys and locks to allow them through the edge of the network. We know to who we have given keys. We also know that we can change the locks. User accounts can be disabled, entry fobs deactivated, etc. And so, if required, physical access to and through the edge of our networks, here a computer connected to our internal LAN of course, can be controlled. Our back door, we can think of here as that to be used by a tradesman, a contractor, somebody who is known to us but not family and is, as such, only granted limited access to our home. This is what we refer to by remote access. When something goes wrong or needs maintenance under a support agreement which is provided to us by a third party, it is more efficient for them and us if they can gain access without necessarily needing to be physically on site. Options available such as VPN, whether this be a direct WAN LAN bridge via a secured tunnel or, as is common, secured access via a web page to a remote desktop connection. These tend to be end user, as in the contractor, initiated. Web based remote desktop connections using, say, WebEx offer another, offer another slightly less secure option. However, as these are enterprise staff, for example, the homeowner, initiated, they can be controlled and risks minimized. So, what about those windows? Not usually how we gain access to our homes. These are things such as leaky Wi-Fi signals, which allow connections onto our networks from people with a laptop sat in a car parked on the street outside, or 3G routers, cleverly concealed in USB sticks left lying around to be picked up by staff and plugged into enterprise computers. The threat landscape is ever-changing. And the more we attempt to ensure that all usual entry methods are secure, the more inventive those who, do not, who we do not wish to gain access become. Spear phishing emails and their associated seemingly innocent websites containing code to insert Trojans onto enterprise computers also provide a means of entry via the windows. These last two leverage human nature and our response must be both technical and training related. Security awareness needs to be raised amongst all staff. Much like, would the last person out please lock the door? Everybody needs to know simple, basic things which can help us ensure our homes, our networks, and our property. In this case, primarily intellectual, is protected. Checking senders' addresses and links in emails before clicking on links. Not trusting anything not provided by Enterprise IT as being safe to connect to Enterprise IT equipment. These are simple lessons to be taught and reaffirmed often. 
In today, today's BYOD environment, this isn't always easy, but must be done as part of the overall solution to this puzzle. Those are some of the options available to us, obviously. Are you who you say you are? How can you prove this to me? If you want to open a bank account, you will often be asked for at least two pieces of identification to support your assertion that you are who you say you are. The same is becoming the case more and more as a means to securing remote access to our enterprise networks. Usernames and passwords used to be all that was needed. But more and more, RSA dongles, software applications with secured keys, or even phone applications will prov also provide a time-limited one-time key, which is also required. Both Google and Microsoft offer authenticator apps, which can be leveraged in this way. These ensure that at least two layers of identity theft need to be compromised before authentication can be attempted. There are also push SMS options, which send a similar one-time code to a known contact at the point of the attempt to gain access. You can think of this as a, a door where the lock is not able to be used, say it's covered by a metal latch plate, uh, until the person outside the door has been seen on a webcam and their face been identified, either using face recognition technology or manually, at which time the plate is withdrawn and the person wishing to gain entry can then use their key, the username and password combination, to open the door and come in. No system can be made 100% secure, of course, so it is imperative that we maintain logs of detected malevolent attacks, that these are securely stored, another layer of security, to prevent manipulation or deletion of records, and that we regularly audit this data to expose either failed attempts and strengthen security accordingly, e.g. take action ourselves, or to report to other authorities to block these nefarious types higher up the chain and so assist, assist others. Think, for example, about ISPs blocking access to the wider network here. Continuous improvement across our entire security picture is necessary. The race is being run, and we must, at the very least, stay level. If we stand still, we will lose. And in this case, what we will lose is control of access to our property, lack of visibility of who has access, and, possibly worst of all, the awareness that we have lost at all. This last could potentially mean an unknown person can come and go as they please. Think a squatter with an invisibility cloak. Not something any of us want in our homes, I'm sure. So, let's have a bit further look at networks. Networks are the fabric of any enterprise. The links that can do so much to improve our business, but in the wrong hands are equally powerful at causing damage. As defined by what is, because, and because I appreciate the brevity of the phrase, IT OT convergence is the integration of information technology, IT systems, used for data centric computing with operational technology, OT systems, used to monitor events, processes, and devices, and make adjustments in enterprise and industrial operations. In other words, IT networks are the ones in the office connecting PCs, printers, VoIP phones, etc. And OT networks are the ones on the production line, connecting PLCs, sensors, OPC servers, and HMI. Until recently, these two were highly unlikely to ever be linked. Indeed, links were actively discouraged in order both to protect the OT devices and ensure their continued operation from the potential dangers present on the internet connected IT network, and also in order to avoid swamping the IT network with the broadcast traffic on the OT network. Today, however, things are very different, as we shall see shortly. IT and OT networks are being squeezed together by demands that are impossible to ignore. From a security point of view, the risks of this squeeze equally cannot be ignored. First up, we'll have a quick look at where we are and how we've arrived at the current picture. Then, differences between network types in use currently and a quick view of things to come. Thirdly, types of companies. This is the scary bit, so you have been warned. If you are digitally squeamish, you may wish to hide behind the monitor at this point. Moving on to types of threats, the who's who of what's been used so far, and what exploits or areas of weakness they've targeted. Lastly, ways to migrate. Not intended as an answer, just some pointers towards possible tools in our armory. So, starting off with a bit of a history, 
Um, here are some recent statements and events which show us how, in a very short space of time, there has been a huge growth in cybercrime against IT and OT networks and the importance national governments are placing on it. As you can see, both US and UK governmental departments are aware of this growing issue, its reach and scale, and this year the UK government launched, with some fanfare, the ncsc.gov.uk site on which you can find many good resources and also a group specifically set up to share awareness of these issues and coordinate response to them. Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, is happening right now. Digitization is helping drive increased productivity, forging ever closer links between IT and OT on all levels. These opportunities must be grasped, of course. We must take advantage of IIoT, the industrial Internet of Things devices, to capture more data, build this data up massively and use analytical tools to spot trends and make adjustments which give us the results we all want. Enhanced productivity, assured quality and, above all, better profits. As ever though, in order to get something, there's a price to be paid. From a security point of view, it is our responsibility to ensure that the price is not the safety of our networks, our products, or our intellectual property. So, let's have a look at the differences between IT and OT networks. Operational technology systems and their associated networks tend to be older. They often are no longer supported nor patched by the manufacturers. This is due mainly to the fact that OT machinery is built to last for many years, even in some cases decades. OT networks subsequently has little or no support for modern encryption or authentication methods. OT systems are mainly designed to operate 24-7, leaving little or no time at all for CI maintenance type tasks like applying service packs, security patches or antivirus updates. The machines they tend to support run all the time to avoid that biggest of costs, downtime. A Gartner definition defines OT networks as hardware and software that detects or causes a change through the direct monitoring and or control of physical devices, processes and events in the enterprise. To me, that speaks of active, direct, impactful and above all physical being the key traits of OT networks. IT, on the other hand, Gartner goes on to define as the entire spectrum of technologies for information processing, including software, hardware, communications technologies, and related services. In general, IT does not include embedded technologies that do not generate data for enterprise use. I understand the above to mean the brains of the enterprise, where the thinking is done, a virtual world, if you will, separate from the real, but able to paint a very real picture of it. Passive, responsive and virtual. That's IT networks as I see them. Moving on to the impacts potentially, um, which explain the reason for the growth of OT attacks. Technical knowledge is no longer needed to gather the tools and carry out an attack. Malware and ransomware are readily available on the dark web. It is even possible now to make use of RAAS, ransomware as a service. DDoS code is available as open source. You just compile it and get a botnet you either control or purchase time from to target what you wish to disrupt. Botnets such as that exposed by Mirai can be easily tasked for money with a job of choice, allowing far wider anonymous reach than ever before. So the bottom line is it's all down to pounds and pence, dollars and cents, or increasingly bitcoins. An attacker can only extract a certain amount of money from an individual or group of individuals. There's far more to be extorted from an enterprise or group of enterprises. Of course, the biggest targets, already coming under threat, are governments of entire countries. Alexander Hanel, who is a security researcher at SecureWorks, says the following about now and the future and the motivations at work. Most ransomware ta attacks are not targeted. It is likely there will be an uptick in targeted attacks in 2017. Comprising corporate environments through targeted, compromising corporate environments, sorry, through targeted attacks allows the attackers to request more money than they would receive from a typical user. That makes enterprise targets 
more attractive. Sorry, bear with me, thank you. Operational technology systems, and there are so, sorry, I'm glad lost my place, bear with me. Sorry, going back to drilling into one type of specific threat to network security. Here, we are looking at malware. We can see that manufacturing utilities technology and healthcare are being actively targeted already. This data is from 2016 and comes thanks to the people at Carbon Black for this. The link to the report, the whole report, is available at the end of this webinar, along with this and other sources. They're highly recommended reading should you wish to find out more or get a wider opinion. Let's have a look at a bit of the detail here. Malware by industry, and all these have what would be considered OT networks, which are more and more being connected to IT networks, don't forget. You can see that 22% of manufacturing, 16% in utilities, 9% in technology, and 6% in healthcare. Adding all those up comes to 53% in total. Over half of all attacks of this type are now in sectors which previously had air gap connections to machinery and or systems which can cause actual physical damage. A couple of charts here. We'll start with the left one first of all. Drilling in on another type of threat, this time the emerging and very much in the news recently, ransomware. Again, we see manufacturing, utilities technology, and healthcare all feature highly on this list. Some details, 16% manufacturing, 15% in utilities, 13% technology, and 10% in healthcare. Again, summing that up, 54%, once more, over half of all attacks of this type are now in sectors where the damage that can be inflicted goes beyond mere digital and into the real, actual, and in some cases, life-threatening sphere. One interesting trend to pick up on here is also the 10% professional services distribution. As a recent BBC story, with a link at the end of the webinar, pointed up, a gang in China known as APT10 has been switching their focus from the direct target to those companies providing professional services to the ultimate end target, and that they have recently ramped up their attacks in an operation called Cloud Hopper. Dr. Adrian Nish, head of threat intelligence at BAE Systems, is quoted as follows. Organizations large and small rely on these providers for management of core systems, and as such they can have deep access to sensitive data. This, as you can imagine, is particularly relevant to us all here at SimLogic, as we are one of these professional service providers to companies in the other sectors high on this list. We are actively and urgently pursuing a scheme supported by the National Cyber Security Center, run under the Crest affiliation to ensure that we progress through the stages of cybersecurity to achieve accreditation under the Cyber Essentials framework. We will not allow ourselves to be a backdoor to any of our clients' property. And we take pride in the fact that to date, we have not been. On the right, you can see some trend data. And if you're in the technologies or utilities and energy sectors, you may want to take a deep breath here. 218% and 112% growth, respectively, in ransomware attacks from 2015 to 2016. Manufacturing, as you can see, has also seen a 24% growth. And I suspect this will be the next sector to see huge growth in attacks over the coming years. Okay, here we go. The scary bit, the types of networks affected. All of these types of networks and systems are at risk, have been targeted, or have been successfully attacked. Once control of the network system has been achieved, the possible implications are a small conveyor, for example. This could be made to run too fast, causing products to not be filled correctly, or to fly off the conveyor. It could be made to stop causing a blockage and downtime. A mixer. This could have highly sensitive recipe intellectual property stolen, or possibly worse, adjusted so that bad, potentially hazardous product was produced. Of course, if our network monitoring hadn't alerted us to the intrusion attack, this product could leave the production line and cause, leave aside the physical injury to anyone consuming it, 
huge reputational damage. Ovens. These could be turned on or off. They could have the temperature adjusted up or down. The results could be fire, explosions, or product cooling and blocking or breaking beyond repair the oven. There's more. Remember, these types of networks and systems are at risk, have been targeted, or have already successfully been attacked. Electricity power grids causing blackouts, as has already happened in 2015 in the Ukraine. More on this later. Surges potentially causing countless unprotected damage to down downstream devices. Water treatment plants. Potentially poisonous water could be put into the system, risking health or the life of thousands of people. Hospitals. A direct threat to life of those ill people reliant on previously air-gapped equipment to sustain critical biological functions. Finally, the worst case scenario possibly imaginable. Nuclear power plants. Way back in 2007-8, a uranium producing centrifuge SCADA system in Iran was successfully attacked, allegedly by a US and Israeli group. It is not a great leap of imagination to go from this relatively benign attempt to prevent production of nuclear material to a nightmare scenario where control over the safety systems of a nuclear reactor were compromised, a ransom demanded to release control back to the power station staff. Perhaps this ransom isn't paid, and the group is so unconcerned by the effects of their actions that they permit the power plant to explode. Yoni Shohet his co-founder and chief executive of a company called SCAR Defense, set the company up specifically to provide security to SCADA and similar industrial systems and networks. And he speaks frankly when he says, these attacks are real. We are seeing more and more of them on a daily basis across a broad spectrum of companies and countries. So let's have a look what's out there, the types of threats. Here's a quick look at some of the events and attacks that have already taken place, whose impacts have included operational downtime, physical damage, intellectual property theft, and what's known as doxing, which is a threat to publish intellectual property, say, for example, the recipe for Coca-Cola. All of these operate on the basis of a ransomware approach, but can lead to other things. 2007 and 8 saw the rise of a virus called Stuxnet, which was a US and Israeli group used, allegedly used to attack a SCADA system in Iran producing the uranium using a centrifuge. In 2011, or a little earlier, Dragonfly, or as it was also known, Energetic Bear, were a group using malware targeting ICS used to steal intellectual property or threaten sabotage by leveraging Trojans, for example, the backdoor um, Aldrea and the Trojan Karagani. This has been used recently against European energy generation companies as a grid operators. 2011 ICS CERT Black Energy Malware was targeting industrial control systems. In 2012, there was an attack called Shamoon, which was also known as Distrack. This was a wiper which deleted files over the weekend when less people are there to mitigate against the losses. Um, and recently, an updated variant of this was spotted in as late as two, in late 2016 and um, was used against a Saudi chemicals company. In 2014, a German steel plant had its SCADA altered following a spear phishing email which contained a malformed PDF which executed code and introduced a backdoor onto the IT network. Further vulnerabilities and privilege escalation techniques were then used to cross over to the OT network and compromise a SCADA system, a PLC, alarm systems which were disabled, safety instrumented systems were also compromised, and finally, HMIs were tampered with. The subsequent loss of control resulted in serious damage to a blast fur furnace. Fortunately, in this case, there were no physical injuries. In 2015, power companies in Ukraine were struck by a variant of Kildisk, which was another wiper, erasing data and overwriting executable code. Furthermore, it blanks out the master boot record and a machine this badly infected will no longer boot. This resulted in monitoring stations going blind, 
thinking that power was still being provided when it had in fact been turned off. This was compounded by a VoIP powered telephone DDoS against the call center which prevented genuine calls getting through and prolonged the blackout which affected some 80,000 homes. A similar attack took place 12 months later affecting this time 225,000 homes. Clearly there were some lessons not well enough learned here. In 2016, what was known as the Mirai botnet, this was an exploit which targeted IoT devices to leverage their combined compute resource to instigate DDoS attacks, which have recently taken the likes of Amazon Web Services, Cloud, and taken that down via it, it was impacting the DIN, DYN Dynamic DNS service. And again, in 2016, product manipulation and a change to the chemicals added to water leveraged a SQL injection on an internet-connected web server to access login credentials for an AS400. This system managed PLCs, so by escalating and cross-connecting, they were able to directly affect the physical chemical composition of the water leaving the plant. The Kimuri Water Company were fortunately able to respond quickly enough to reverse the changes made by the unknown hacktivist group and prevent serious harm to human health. You can see from the above that one thing leads to another and another and another until ultimately the desired result is achieved. So what's next? The next generation types of attacks will include threats based on artificial intelligence leveraging machine learning to mimic observed human behavior and thus avoid detection. An Indian company called Darktrace is already trying to develop defenses against this type of threat using their own AI and machine learning that they have specifically developed for this purpose. So, moving on to things that we can do to mitigate. What can cybersecurity, cybersecurity professionals like ourselves do? Firstly, we can design. Micro segmentation, like bulkheads in ships, so a hole in one area doesn't sink the ship. The use of physical disparate net, physical networks and logical networks, subnets or VLANs, is one way of micro-segmenting, with only the minimum required crossover points, which are tightly controlled by side-to-side -side firewalls, which have been locked down, both in terms of what they permit to tr tr transit them in terms of traffic types and ports, but also in terms of from which source and to which destination. Any one or any software application introduced into any part of our networks can only do so much damage when we have micro-segmented before it simply cannot get any further. It is contained, allowing us time to analyze and respond accordingly. One example is a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, which is an area of a, a LAN which has an external public internet facing surface. These should only be used where absolutely essential and much tighter network edges should be employed along with enhanced monitoring. This network monitoring should be across the entire environment, should be considered an essential. We must know if new devices attempt to use our network. If a previously known device, say, changes its physical MAC address or its DNS name, we should know. We should be alerted if traffic patterns vary from the norm or if match patterns of known threats. And all of the above will help us to respond more quickly. Entrap. The use of honeypots, for example, or canaries. Um, Cleverly positioned within the separate areas of our networks should be sacrificial machines which look enticing as if they have value or valuable information on them or if they look weak say of old antivirus definitions or out of date operating systems or service packs. These machines should be responsible for no other function than to alert us when they are attacked and ultimately penetrated. Much as it was better for a miner to see his canary die in its cage than for him and his mates to drop dead these machines should be our early warning of intrusion or attack. How do we respond? The incident response consists obviously of training, planning and preparing. Security staff should be well trained and versed in the appropriate and necessary means and methods to respond to different threat types, attack targets and information sensitivity. Prior to attacks taking place, all parties from the sea level down should plan how they would best like to see responses take place. They should document the procedures that, if followed, will most likely lead to these outcomes. And they should attempt to allow in their plans for the unforeseen, even if this allowance is simply a feedback loop which leads to the creation of a new plan and a procedure to deal with the newly discovered threat. So they must be prepared, obviously. 
and how do we prepare? Well, we can run trial attack incidents that should be run alongside regular penetration tests to assess the readiness state of security staff and systems to respond adequately and in conformance with both an enterprise's own requirements and, where applicable, the appropriate regulatory body or advisory body. In order to do that, people are going to need to be trained. And training for security staff is, needs to be in line with those points raised in the respond. But perhaps more importantly for all staff, especially for items previously mentioned, such as spear phishing, spoof websites, spurious items of IT equipment, the vast majority of intrusions begin with a small error made by an individual which grants the first access, which is then leveraged and escalated in order to become a truly serious and damage-inflicting episode. If security staff can make use of all of the staff in an enterprise to assist in stopping the intrusions at the first and lowest level, this is clearly beneficial. So, how can we ensure that we've got security on our production lines now that we're no longer air-gapped? How can we help look after ourselves? Gone are the days when a device didn't need to be secure because it was only possible to get connected to it by being physically in front of it, often on the factory floor with a proprietary cable and the correct software installed on a laptop with an expensive license or a specific serial port configuration. That sort of scenario still exists, but the proportion of those type of devices to others is diminishing as rapidly as the number of internet connected devices is increasing which seems to be exponential. Um, the big data and associated data analytics are powerful tools used to help drive ERP level decisions. More and more, the end users of these systems do not want filtered, delayed or modified versions of raw data. If there is a PLC counting how many bottles pass a light sensor connected to it, they want that number available to them in real time, whether they are in the office or on the golf course. To this end, devices, no matter how old or insecure, are being connected to networks. We've already looked at the layers of security, both on and at the edge of the network. Now we must look at the device and software layer. Secured configurations concerns the end of everything, everyone, as the default permission configuration used just to make things work. Authenticated users ideally mapped back to a central user base such as Active Directory with all its enterprise level encryptions and tools to monitor and control should be the norm, if not the obligatory requirement for devices and for permissions not only to access these devices themselves, but certainly to make configuration changes either to them or to the software running on them. Minimizing the exposed surface area of a device or system is a common sense approach to further enhancing the security. Say, for example, that a building has five doors, but everyone usually comes in through only one or another one, then it would be prudent and not impact the use of the building to permanently secure the other three doors and so prevent access via these means. The same principle applies to the ports and services running on a device or system. If only those necessary for the functionality of the system are accessible via the network it is connected to, then efforts to secure it can be concentrated there. A variant of minimizing in this way, which combines secured configurations, is duration exposure reduction. This is the user and password combinations which expire every X days. Thus, should a compromise occur and go undetected, it will only be available for a defined amount of time. Preventing privilege escalation is all about using the lowest level of permissions necessary to ensure the functionality required is available and making any gateways to higher functionality robust and sufficiently well monitored to prevent, for example, a brute force attack against them. This can usually best be achieved in conjunction with network traffic pattern analysis, of course. But if the system or device is configured to use an administrator level user account, then an intrusion at this point already has a head start on the response team and processes. It will be more able to do more damage and potentially sidestep to other systems before it can be contained. Going back to our house metaphor, we wouldn't give the, door, the keys to the door to a four-year-old, would we? Patching and updates, as much as these are difficult on 24-7 production sensitive equipment or systems, best practice is to do it when possible, e.g. on planned maintenance days or on full shutdowns. Of course, this means having tested the impact of the patches beforehand 
and having, in the case of unexpected difficulties, a solid rollback position. Difficult to implement from new without good documentation and well understood interactions matrix of various systems and devices, this patching and updating can be a real challenge if it has never been part of the security response process in the past. However, it's very relevant, and I'm sure we've all heard of WannaCry, PetCry, and the NotPetya attacks recently. Patching alone would have prevented the vast majority of the distributed damage of these ransomware and malware attacks because even though the CIA discovered the Eternal Blue exploit years ago and sat on it before it was released via WikiLeaks to the public, they had informed Microsoft about it, who had released a patch to prevent the exploit being used. Those companies who had and do keep their patching up to date slept much easier whilst reading the headlines of this this year. Many tools exist to, uh, exist to assist in patching and testing patches before releasing to production environments. And it really is the simplest way to reduce risk. Um, as promised, here are some links to some sites and the articles which I've referred to within this presentation. I hope it's been of interest to you all and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, that was a great insight into the importance of cybersecurity and the steps that you can take to protect your manufacturing operations from harm. If you have submitted any questions using the control panel, uh, we will respond to them after the webinar via email. And just to remind you that we will be sending out the recorded version of this webinar over the coming days so that you can re-watch and please feel free to share with your colleagues or re-watch at your own leisure. If you'd like to discuss anything that you've heard today or any other concerns that you've got um, or would just want some pointers on how to uh, help increase the security of your systems further, please get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with one of our experts such as Chris here. Uh, you can contact us by email, enquiries at simlogic.co.uk or you can call us on 0127459955. Um, so all there is left to say is thank you for joining us today and we hope that you enjoyed the webinar. Goodbye.